My subject today is going to be the uh, Quaker Meeting House, and uh, I'm going to talk first to give you a little bit of background um, about Quakers, and then we'll talk a little about the early history of Quakers in Hartford. And then by way of going into the building, we'll look at the accounts which still survive of uh, the building, and then we're going to look at the building structure, both inside and out, and I'll make some comments and some uh, comparisons. Then I'll briefly say something about why it is that the meeting house might have survived where many others haven't. And then we'll hopefully finish. So let's turn to my first slide. And... Um, if you don't know, the Quakers or Society of Friends started in the mid 16th century. We usually date it to 1652, the mid 17th century, he says, getting his first error in there, um, and was inspired by a number of itinerant preachers, of whom the most notable were George Fox, who is generally thought as the leader of the Quakers, and James Naylor, who, is, who might have been the leader, but uh, for various circumstances. Um, Quakers maintained as their distinctive uh, belief that unmediated access to the divine is available to all, which we would today identify as the inward light perhaps the light of Christ um, or the inward teacher. And they taught that attention to this inward light or God uh, would lead to right actions and the achievements of God's kingdom on earth. Quakers um, from 1660, along with all the other nonconformist underwent periods of persecution, and we shall hear that in the story of Hartford Quakers. Nevertheless, they evangelised the whole of the uh, uh, whole of England and Wales and a bit of Scotland and Ireland and achieved membership of about 1% of the um, population by the 1670s, which is a spectacular rise and they've been declining ever since. So, what about Quaker worship? Quakers adopted from early on the Seeker tradition, a, a, a tradition they inherited from a group called the Seekers, and that is the practice of silent waiting worship. Quakers gather in silence and they wait for a word or message or ministry to be given. They also held at that time and for about 150 years, open so-called threshing meetings, which were open invitations to everybody um, to come along and hear the Quaker message. And those were usually outdoor and fairly noisy affairs. If you were in a meeting for worship and you were given a message to give to the, uh, the rest of the group, that was described as ministry and it was open to all men and women. But it was found early on that there were some people who had a greater gift than others and they, they were called ministers. Although they were not clergy, um, Quakers often say, that all Quakers are clergy and we have no laity. And those ministers began to sit in special places in the rooms where people were worshipping, perhaps raised a little on a podium. Later, elders were appointed, and rather like elders in the Presbyterian Church, they were responsible for the conduct of worship. As well as worship meetings, 
Quakers held business meetings, and those business meetings were held in a spirit of worship. And from the first, they were held separately for men and women. Worship was not held separately, but business meetings were. And this characteristic, both the characteristic of having ministers who might want to be raised up and the, the necessity for separating men and women for business um, had powerful effects on the architecture, as we shall see. So I'm going to show you, just to familiarise yourself with the ideas of what a meeting house might look like, a couple of pictures. The one here on the left is a picture of a meeting. It's in fact one of the large meeting houses in London, in Grace Church Street in the city. And this picture was painted about 1770, we think. We don't know who painted it. And it shows a meeting for worship. And the things that you can see clearly are that most people are sitting on benches facing forward, that women sit on one side of the room and men sit on the other, which was not a Quaker characteristic necessarily, but was something which happened in many uh, worship settings in England at that time. And in front of them, there were some benches which were facing the other way, sometimes called the facing benches. The other proper name for this um, structure here is the minister's stand or minister's bench. And those people who were ministers sat on the upper level of the bench. And those people who were elders sat on the lower level of the bench. And everyone stayed standing unless they were given a message to deliver. And in which case they stood up like this minister in the middle here. And the one thing that happened if you stood up to minister was you took your hat off. Quakers only took their hat off to God and therefore only when they were ministering. And you'll see this man's hat is stuck on a peg behind him. I just thought I'd show you this rather later picture because it shows a slightly more rural setting. This is a picture of the meeting house in Erith in Cambridgeshire, painted around the 1830s by a Hitchin Quaker called Samuel Lucas. And it shows, again, a man ministering at the back and he's taken his hat off, although I think he probably has put it down beside him. And again, you see, these would have been the elders here in the front, the women sitting to one side, the men sitting to another. Okay, let's move on then to look at the history of Friends in Hartford. Our first record is that around 1655, James Naylor, one of those leading preachers I told you about, came to Hartford where he held a meeting at Henry Sweeting's house. And from this time, we think um, the Quaker meeting in Hartford uh, commenced. And from, but meetings were held in people's houses for a good number of years. In fact, um, for at least 15 years. When the king uh, came back at the Restoration in 1660, he promised, of course, um, some degree of toleration for all religions, but he couldn't achieve that in the face of the, the so-called Cavalier Parliament. And from 1660, there were a number of laws passed which uh, penalised both Quakers and other non-conformists. And our earliest record in Hartford of the effects of that was in January 1661. Uh, nine Quakers were arrested as they worshipped in meeting and were jailed. And two or three weeks later, another 20 of them were taken out of the meeting for worship 
and put in the jail. We also find recorded in 1661 the first burials at the original burial ground for Quakers, um, a private Quaker burial ground that is in Hartford, which was on Port Hill. And those first burials are uh, recorded in 1661. And then in 1662, some of those friends who had been jailed were released, but we still know that 22 remained in jail. In October of 1662, four friends from the Quaker meeting in Hartford were arraigned in front of the, the justices for non-attendance at church. This was, um, had been a um, illegal uh, since the Elizabethan times when it was put in place for Catholics, but it was used against uh, non-conformists of all sorts. And they were arraigned for non-attendance in church. And one of the things that happened to Quakers when they were arraigned in court is they were asked to take the oath of allegiance because the justices knew that um, Quakers refused to take oaths and they refused to take oaths on biblical grounds because Jesus said, swear not at all. But of course, refusing to take the oath of allegiance to the crown made you effectively treasonable and people were prosecuted under a 15th 15th century writ called Primineary. Um, and if you were convicted of Primineary, uh, you were, in fact, your goods and yourself were basically forfeit to the king. Um, so these people were put in prison permanently. And the, the four who were put in prison were consequently released after an appeal to the king after 31 weeks. In 1664, 12 friends attending the meeting were charged under the Conventicle Act, which was the, uh, the act which was meant to stop people meeting for worship, or as the act says, under the pretense of worship. Um, and the 12 friends that were arrested in that case um, were jailed and ordered to be transported to the, to the West Indies. A long saga followed, which I can't go into here, um, whereby the justices um, bailiff tried to find a ship to take them to the West Indies. He, he, um, he found a ship called the Anne, uh, but the master of the ship refused to sail with them. He didn't want to transport people to the West Indies simply um, for uh, meeting for worship. And eventually the friends were returned to jail. In 1664, there was a further trial of another seven friends who were similarly convicted. Our first records of the meeting in its first minute book commenced in 1668 and in 1669 while all these friends at least 15 but probably more were in prison in Hartford it was decided to build a meeting house very curious time to choose but that when we know they did and on the 4th of October that year a Quaker tailor called Edward Parkin conveyed some ground that he owned um, to another Quaker, William Adams, for a meeting house site. And on the following day, William Adams conveyed to the meeting house to trustees. And the trustee says, for the universal surface of the truth, owned by the people of God, called by the people of the world, Quakers, and more especially for the use, benefit, and behoof of such people as now are or shall be hereafter friends to truth 
dwelling in or near Hartford. One of the many names that Quakers called themselves was Friends to Truth. And in the following year, the building of the meeting house was finally completed. And that's why we celebrate 1670 as the date of the meeting house and of course last year as its 350th anniversary. So let's just put ourselves in context. No, let's go forward and talk about the meeting house accounts, the accounts for building the meeting house. First of all, there are two sets of building house accounts in the minute book. One appears to date from around 1671, and the other, which is more extensive, to around 1673. Uh, the final cost appears to have been 243 pounds 12 shillings, of which six pounds was the cost of the land, and at least 10%, 24 pounds or more, difficult to determine, was paid out of wages. The rest were costs of building materials. And if we look at the wages, it's quite interesting. Those wages vary between one and, um, one and, sorry, uh, one shilling and tuppence and two shillings per day. And the most, that means the most skilled were therefore earning around 30 pounds a year. So that puts into context the cost of the meeting house, which was about eight pounds of a skilled, eight years, sorry, of a skilled man's salary. And that put it into uh, the modern context of a skilled man's salary. And perhaps we're looking then at more like a quarter of a million pounds. Okay. Now, one work, thing worth noticing is that at least 13 and sixpence was paid out on beer for the workmen. If we want to compare the costs as whether this was an expensive or a cheap meeting house, it was about three times as much as it cost to build the meeting house in Settle in Yorkshire, and that was a couple of years later, but less than half the £650 the Bristol Friends spent on their meeting house in 1670. And as we shall see in a minute, about 80% of the cost was met by seven large donors, three of whom supplied materials as well as cash. So let's go on and to look at those accounts. Here on the left is a picture of one of the pages of the minute book showing those accounts set out in a very flowery um, 17th century hand and adding up here at the bottom at 243 pounds and 12 shillings. And here are the names of the people who made those contributions. And here are the seven, Henry Stout, Richard Thomas, Nicholas Lucas, Nathaniel Garrod, Henry Sweeting, and down at the bottom, Richard Martin, who gave in excess of 10 pounds, oh, and William Fairman. Okay, these were all fairly affluent friends. Henry Stout was a maltster, Richard Thomas a brewer, Nicholas Lucas, another maltster, uh, Nathaniel Garrod, we don't know what his trade was, um, Henry Sweeting was a but butcher, William Fairman was a brewer, and Richard Martin, uh, at the bottom here, was another maltster. Um, malting barley was one of the main occupations in Hartford and Ware at the time. And these affluent friends, together with two others, Abraham Rutt, who was uh, Nathaniel Garrod's father-in-law, and Edward Parkin, who'd supplied the land, were the trustees for the meeting house. 
Let's look now at the expenses. And again, here's the reproduction of the expenses accounts. And what do we see? Well, we see that we're spending money quite a lot on timber here. Holder here is um, a Quaker and he was the chief carpenter. So he was supplying timber and roofing materials. Okay, John Holder. Other Quakers who are supplying things are the Basils, Edward and John, um, and down here, Henry Sweeting, we see again, and over here, um, Henry Martin, Nicholas Lucas. Those are Quakers who are, are giving things. And then you'll see that there's a guy called Brace here who's paid for work, and here, the work with another labourer. And here, Catlin is being paid for work. And again, I wish I could find the other entrance for Catlin. There is another one, but I can't find it at the moment. Here it is for removing some stuff. And we can take Catlin and Brace are essentially contractors of various kinds. Note also the widow Russell, who is clearly carrying on her husband's business and the widow Russell is shown here as someone who supplies glazing and colouring. That's paint, of course. As well as wood, we see there are deals. And deals, of course, are planks and they're wood used for flooring and for wainscoting. And here are the individual workers' payments. Here's one for one pound and tuppence. Here's one for half a day. What, sorry, not one pound, one shilling and tuppence. Half a day for eight pence. So that would have been um, 16 pence, one and four pence. Um, here's another person being paid one and four pence a day. And here is the person who's being paid most, young Chamberlain, and he's being paid two pounds a day. So now let's talk about the meeting house itself. You probably all know where the meeting house is today. It's here on Railway Street, just at the intersection with Birchley Street. And here's Blue Coat Avenue, and here's the Ring Road. Here's the uh, 1766, which is the map we have nearest um, to the date of the erection. And here's the Quaker Meeting House shown on that map in Back Street, as it was in those days. Very close to the Bridewell, one of the prisons. And surrounded by space. Okay, gardens and other non-built-on areas. Very unlike it is today. So let's move on to looking at the meeting house itself. And this is the meeting house as those of you who have been there will know it today. Well, as you can see, it's a construction of brick with a tile roof. And we have these two very large front gables, um, which were probably modeled on the surrounding houses. This is a very domestic appearance for a building. But the most striking thing about the building really, we've got windows in the gables, but down here at ground level, we've got a door, obviously here on the left, but it's quite clear that originally there was a door here on the right. You can see the door surround has been bricked up in different bricks. And you can also see that we originally had three windows, right? Much larger than the current windows. And again, they've been bricked up. You can still see the sills, the original sills at the bottom of each of these brickings up. 
So it's a bit of a mystery there. Was this originally built with large windows or was it built with small windows which were enlarged and then closed up again? We shall see later. You can also see that there is a very large chimney here at the back. And that's probably original too. We'll go on to look at the back of the current building. Here's the back of the current building. Okay, and here you see the door, which is opposite the door at the front. Here you look on the plan, you'll see the front door that we saw and the bricked up door and the three windows that we saw at the front. Through, there's a long lobby with this door, the other end. Okay, Hit in the back, however, we have another bricked up door here. And between those two bricked up doors, we currently have two windows. It's, it's very difficult to tell whether there had been a window in the middle here or not. The, um, it's not clear, but I think probably not. <clears throat> Certainly we lack the brick arch which you can see over the windows at the front. See, across both all three of those windows, there's a brick arch, but not in the middle here at the back. So probably there are always two windows and two doors at the back. And these windows look like, look as if they're the same size as the windows of the front might have been at one time. But at the back, we also have a dormer window in the roof. And you'll notice that the gabled roof is running at right angles to the ones at the front. And you can see that better in this uh, side elevation here. Here's the back gable, and here's one of the front gables, and they're at right angles to each other. And looking here on the plan, you can see the timbers which we need to support those gables and the roof structure, which run across at ceiling level. And here is the position, as we shall see in a minute, of a large freestanding post, which supports these basic timbers. And here it is in the side elevation. Okay. Let's continue. And I want to look at a few comparisons of other meeting houses of the similar age. Oh, wait a minute, let's summarize first. Here we are. So the building is quite large, 42 foot by 34 and three quarters. That's 12 by 12, nearly 13 by 11 meters externally. And it's built of brick with a tiled roof. The north and south aspects are both symmetrical, with doors at either end and windows in between, and in the front gables. Roof has a complex form, with two gabled roofs se separated by a valley at the front, and a single gabled roof running at right angles to the other two at the rear. The interior is a single large room, and that necessitates the wooden post to hold up the roof timbers. The outwardly domestic appearance is probably in keeping with the neighboring buildings. So let's look at some other Quaker buildings of the similar time. This is the very famous building at Brick Flats in Cumbria of 1675 and five years later. And as you see, it's of a similarly domestic design, but in a different vernacular. It's stone built, it has a stone roof. It has a rather large porch, as you might well need in the bitter uh, winds which blow across Cumbria. And it has very um, small windows. This is at Adderbury in Oxfordshire, and it's must let must much less domestic in appearance. But as you see, it has a dormer window. And it has a symmetrical appearance, two windows at the front with a central door. 
So these two don't have two doors as, as the one at Hartford does. They only have a single door. So perhaps one of the remarkable things about Hartford is that it has t- apparently has had two doors. Looking now at another contemporary um, building of 1675 to six, and this is at Ifield in Sussex. And as you see, this has a very similar shape roof-wise uh, to Hartford, two front gables, and at the rear, a right-angled gabled roof. But again, and we have windows in the gables and we have windows in the front, but we only have a single door. Okay. The only place we generally find double doors in a meeting house are in other non-conformist meeting houses. In this case, a Unitarian meeting house, originally Presbyterian in Rivington in Cheshire. And here we have the long side of a rectangular building with two windows and two doors. So the two doors at Hartford are much more like another sort of meeting house, not a Quaker one. And finally, let's just look at the inside quickly, just for the moment. This is the inside of the meeting house as we see it today. And this is the freestanding post, which just has two struts either side to support the main roof beam. And this, just for comparison, is the similar structure at Ifield, which again, because it's a relatively large room and has those similar roof structures, has a single beam in the center here, uh, this time with chamfered struts. And in fact, there are four of them here. We only have two. There are no struts to the beams which are run, run this way. Okay. So that's a first look at the meeting house. To introduce the other aspects of the meeting house, I want to go on and look at the later history. And the first thing I want to comment on is that in the minutes in in 1676, we find it reported that two women, a widow, Mary King, and a single woman, Alice, no surname given, were living in the meeting house. And perhaps this may have something to do with the fireplaces. It's not unusual to find records of people living in meeting houses. And one of the reasons that that happened was that under the various acts which prosecuted uh, Quakers, or could be used to prosecute Quakers, one of the things that could happen is people could try and demolish the meeting house. And there were several meeting houses demolished. But under common law, if someone was living in a place, you couldn't demolish it. And so it may have been useful to have people living in the meeting house to prevent it being demolished. One other thing we find in the 1680s is that the meeting house was apparently left unused for either worship or business. We think these two women were still living there for 22 months. And after that period in 1687, it's noted that repairs were needed to be made. Now, this was a period throughout the the UK when persecution of nonconformists and particularly Quakers was um, rife. And so we think this is probably the meeting house was closed up because it was being attacked, but not demolished. And so people went back to meeting in friends' houses. We find further repairs to the meeting house in 1698. And then after the great storm, which was a national great storm, 
on the 26th of November, 1703. It was a storm which um, sank a great deal of shipping and in fact, um, knocked pinnacles off King's College Chapel in Cambridge and demolished the first at its own lighthouse it was a considerable cyclone. They needed to spend six pounds and 10 shillings on repairing the damage to the meeting house and the gates. In 1704, we have the first evidence that the women were meeting separately for business. When the meeting minuted that the fourth day's meeting for worship shall be kept in the women's meeting house for the winter season. Typically, friends met on Sundays, or as they would have said, first days, and on Wednesdays, fourth days for worship. Now, we know there wasn't a separate women's meeting house at this time. The separate building, which you can now see in the front of the meeting house, was not erected in the yard for the women until 1738. So we have to assume that this 1704 reference means that the women were meeting somewhere else in the building. And we'll go on to look at where that might have been. So let's go back to the picture of the inside of the meeting house on a plan. You saw there was a long lobby here on the west side of the meeting house. This is north, incidentally, that's south. Um, on the west side, on this west side of the meeting house, there's a long lobby, and over the top of it, at present, there's a gallery. We don't know if that gallery was there at the very beginning. But we do know that it was there in the late 17th century, uh, the late 17th century. And this lobby has a fireplace and the gallery upstairs has a fireplace too. So let's go and look at them. So let's look at the side of the gallery. Here it is. You've already seen this view before. And down here at the bottom, Behind these, this panelling is the lobby. And these panels you see here, 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 here and here are all removable. We call them shutters and they can be taken out so that people standing or sitting in the lobby can see into the meeting house. And similarly up here, we have shutters. Okay, so people standing or sitting in the gallery can also see into the meeting house. And galleries and lobbies were often separated by this sort of shutter system in old meeting houses, so that when there were a lot of people attending a meeting, you could find extra space for them. And galleries inside churches and other chapels were used in a similar way. But the shuttering is a peculiarly Quaker way. And this is because these areas were used for other things when they weren't being used for meeting houses. One of those things might be, as we suggested, for someone to live in. OK, but the other thing, as we've just remarked, is that there was somewhere for the women to meet. The men would have meet, met down here in the main meeting room. But the women, we think, would probably have met in the gallery up here. So let's go and look at that. Oh, well, let's look at a couple of other galleries from other meeting houses first. This is a contemporary meeting house in Cornwall at Come to Good. It has a much less um, structurally uh, impressive gallery. It looks rather amateurish, doesn't it, on the, sitting on those two posts. But as you see, it's open. It doesn't have shutters, just a balustrade. And here at Stourbridge, we do have shutters and a balustrade. So let's look at the one at Hartford. And now I'm up in the, um, we're up in the gallery. And it's currently divided into two rooms. This is the first room here. And here are the shutters. Okay, and you can see we've got plaster walling uh, 
with struts, wooden struts at top and bottom. Okay, now in this room, there's also the remains of a fireplace. Okay, with quite a big overmantel. And this may well have been the room in which the women lived. Through the opening here, and there's a stud wall, um, you can see that this other half of the meeting house, and this is the north end. So this window is one of the windows in the gables at the front. This is used as a library now, and here we have more shutters. And just to uh, show you a little eccentricity, this is one of the shutters, and it's got a, an 18th century bit of graffiti. Someone whose initials were JB um, has written J, his initials and the date 1711, probably, here. But he appears to have written them sideways. Now, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. Most graffiti are written parallel, as you would on a piece of paper or any other surface. And so we think that these shutters were at some time originally set at right angles to where they are currently. And the reason for them having been turned through 90 degrees is that at some point, the opening was made larger and the shutters were reused by turning them through 90 degrees and using them upright rather than side to side. And that's why, in fact, all the graffiti you find, or certainly all the 17th and 18th century graffiti you find here are all written sideways like this. So this is what the gallery looks like. And then let's go downstairs. This is the uh, fireplace downstairs. And as you see, it looks as if it ought to have had an ingle nook, doesn't it? With the grate here and perhaps seats either side, but it's certainly a substantial fireplace. Here's the back door, which we saw earlier, which is probably original. And it has a pretty hefty lock on it. And interestingly, lots of coat pegs. And here is the staircase going up to the gallery. And here it's seen, you can see the staircase better. But here you can see that the balusters are flat, but carved to look like turned balusters. Uh, they're cut out, but flat, an interesting variant. So, and this is just to say something, Quaker meeting houses are often thought of, of as very plain. This is not plain, this is slightly decorated, isn't it? Um, and it's the characteristic of meeting houses that they are modestly decorated, I would say. So one other thing we need to look at in the meeting house, and that's the minister's stand. I told you that meet, meeting houses had a minister's stand where the ministers would sit. And I just want to look back in the minutes at what we know about the minister's stand. In June 1704, the minutes rec record that John Wallace was desired to provide four new forms for the meeting house gallery. Now, this is where we come across um, an embarrassing double use of terms. What I've called a gallery, and you will have seen this in a previous slide, this one is also called a loft, right? And this, which we call the stand, which is inside the meeting room, is also referred to as a gallery, just to confuse everybody. So these six new forms would certainly not have fitted in the gallery as we know it, and were probably made for a stand in the meeting house. In 1711, there's a note in the minutes that the trustees should be asked to consult about the alteration of the outer door next to the gallery. So we know that by this time, whatever the gallery looked like, it was on the west wall. 
sorry, the east wall of the meeting house, as it is presently. And in June 1717, we find this longer minute. It's agreed by the meeting that the windows on the north and south sides of this meeting house be altered and made sash windows and a double door and porch at the entrance on the north side and the two doors next to the gallery closed up and made windows. With what other necessary amendments that friends hereafter name shall see meet, viz. John Miles, John Stout and Benjamin Fairman, to whom the sole management of this affair is committed. So we know that in 1717, they needed to close the two doors next to the gallery. So the gallery as we see it now, and here it is, and we're looking now at the meeting house from the, the entrance lobby. As you see, it extends all the way across that east wall and it has four levels. The level at the front, one, two, you can see them better in this picture here. Here's the bench at the front, second level, third level, fourth level. It's a remarkably large um, minister's stand. Here you see it's decorated with a newel post at the top of the stairs, which run down the side. And there are some seats attached to the wall. Now, those seats actually go across where the doors, which you can see in the north and south walls, as, yeah, were. And so the reference to these doors being removed must have been at the time when this bit of the stand was fitted. That's all we know. The stand might have been on this wall for a longer period, but it, these, this return and the current stairs only provided in 1717, or, well, that's all we know. And lastly, I want to talk a bit about these windows. Here we're looking at an old black and white photograph, which shows us very clearly that inside these windows, you can still see the outline of where the windows, a larger window must have been. Okay, here's the sill. And perhaps this is where the sashes were. Okay, sash windows were very, very fashionable in the 18th century. And enormous numbers of meeting houses had their older mullioned windows changed into sashes. And it looks as if Hartford friends were following the fashion. But subsequently they were bricked up and something which looks very much like a 17th century window was placed in them. Now, did that happen? We don't think it happened in 1717 because that's when the sashes were put in. So when did that happen? One of the, re the references suggests it happened in the mid 18th century, but we don't know. Because let's look at one of these windows in more detail and you'll see that the catches we have on those windows look very much like the sort of wrought iron catches you see on late 17th century windows. So these are either the original late 17th century windows and ca uh, catches, which have been kept and replaced, uh, or they have been made to look like them. We can't rule that out, unfortunately. So we've talked a lot about the meeting house. Let's just look at the back of the building, where there's presently a garden surrounded by a high wall. That high wall is almost certainly 18th or 19th century, because as we saw, in, even in the late 18th century, in 1776, there was no such wall around the meeting house, not at the back at any rate. We have some memorial stones here, which have always been there or were placed there 
sometime in the 19th or 20th century. And we have here some much older stones, probably 19th century ones. And these were brought here from the Port Hill burial ground when it was closed and sold in 1971. So these headstones come from older graves. So now I want to say something about the survival of the meeting house. May, very many town meeting houses were abandoned in the 19th century because they were thought to be old fashioned and not large enough. And larger meeting houses were built. In neighboring Hitchin, a very large meeting house, which is now the council offices, in fact, was built in 1838 and their city center 18, uh, uh, late 17th century meeting house uh, was sold off and, and demolished. Further changes in, in city centre meeting houses and town centre meeting houses were made in the 20th century, either because of bomb damage or because town planners wanted the site or because road schemes wanted the site. These were very popular in the 50s and 60s. And a road scheme, in fact, a road widening, had caused the part demolition of the women's meeting house at the front of the Hartford um, uh, meeting house in the 1930s. Meeting houses which survived generally were already of a generous size. And I've always already said, that the meeting house at Hartford is quite a large one for its time and may well have served because it was large. And secondly, not in the very centre of town. And this is true too of Hartford. It's sitting on the eastern edge of the centre of the town as it was in the 18th and 19th century with the market square uh, well to the west of it. So these two factors the size of the meeting house and its position in the town may well have been the reasons why it survived. So to summarize, the meeting house is very large for an early example, but typically vernacular and domestic in style. It was initially built in 1670, but was considerably reordered inside sometime between 1704 and 1717, so that we can't be sure of the original internal arrangements. And in fact, it's been changed at various times since. Um, there was a considerable restoration in 1953, and again in, the, in 1980, several things were done. In particular, the large steel girders, which support the roof, on column, steel columns were put in. However, it now has a typical arrangement of a full width lobby with a gallery above, separated by shutters. And this it shares with a lot of meeting houses of the 17th, 18th and even 19th century. The minister's stand is again large with four levels of seating, steps at the side and doors. Uh, restricting access to the upper level. There was a separate meeting house for the women's meeting, which eventually became the Sunday school and is now described as the Priory Rooms. And it's a rare survival of an early meeting house in a county town. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you friends for listening. I can also recommend to you my blog on the WordPress site, it's called meetinghouses.wordpress.com and here you see the front page and it talks about a number of meeting houses. I'm going to stop screen sharing now.